Uh, I'm Kevin Sandler, professor in the Film Media Studies program, also director of uh, internships and in charge of bringing some of our uh, wonderful uh, speakers along, uh, which uh, we have our, our first one uh, of this year, uh, a alumni of the Film and Media Studies program, Adam Galen. Just uh, a little bit, thank you, I'll, I'll speak louder, speak louder. Uh, uh, just uh, before I, I present everybody, if anybody can uh, kind of put your phones away and your computers uh, and, uh, and direct all your attention up here. Uh, Adam uh, Galen is uh, someone who graduated from Film and Media Studies as well as uh, the W.B. Carey uh, Business School uh, in spring 2014. And, and he is someone who uh, has been quite successful just shortly after uh, graduation, but quite successful in terms of what he had accomplished during, uh, during his time here in terms of success at school, uh, internships, uh, both <coughs> across many different sectors of the film and television industries that he'll talk about. Uh, attending the Sundance Film Festival, in which uh, we have done for about six years in a row. For those people who are 21 and over, um, deadline is today uh, for Sundance Film Festival, for people who are in uh, FMP or FPR or the FMS program. So if you don't have any questions about that, certainly uh, talk to me uh, uh, later. Uh, but for right now, uh, just a little bit about Adam, what he's currently doing. Uh, Adam is a manager what is this, of what digital content? There we go. Worldwide sales. Yeah, of uh, it's a lot of words. Manager of worldwide sales and digital affairs at Preferred Content in Los Angeles. Uh, he'll certainly tell you, uh, you know, what that is because it's a very complicated uh, multimedia company uh, uh, in, involved in lots of different sectors. Uh, in the television industry. Um, their uh, firm is responsible for many, many independent films, uh, several that have gone on to win awards, uh, one being uh, Rich Hill, uh, another one my favorite that I love, uh, the uh, I Am Big Bird, the Carol Spinney story, which is certainly a classic, uh, uh, as well as, as several other movies. So, uh, you know, here he is to kind of tell you about the state of the independent film market today, as well as what you have to do in order to succeed uh, uh, at ASU in order to uh, make it in Hollywood after you graduate. So, Adam, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Awesome, thanks. So, uh, I guess we have a couple different classes here today. So, just as we start out, and so I can kind of hone in on what I should focus on on uh, different topics. I was just curious, out of you guys here, how many of you are planning to or want to go work in Hollywood, film, television after you graduate? Pretty much everyone, okay, cool. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of different areas of film. Well, there's a ton of different areas of film and ways you can work in it, um, whether it's like in post, in production, purely on the business side, being an agent. But for any of you that have an idea already, to, who here wants to work in independent film? Couple, what about television? Cool, and who knows they want to be like more on the business side, whether it's an agency or executive producing, finance, things like that. Just a couple, okay, cool. So I'll give you just a brief background of um, what I was doing at ASU before I even came onto the film side and then I'll talk about kind of what I did while I was here uh, before I moved out to LA. So, like Kevin said, I was actually in the W.P. Carey School of Business. I was an economics major, um, which after my freshman year, I decided was not fulfilling and really boring to me. And so I took on a double major in marketing. Um, and after a semester of doing marketing and economics, I decided it still wasn't something that I wanted to do, and I'd love to film my whole life, and I was just gonna like take a shot and try and figure out how I could work in film, but I had no idea what that really meant. Like my biggest indicator of what it was to work in film was watching Entourage, binge watching Entourage, um, and that's what I thought I wanted to do, was like to be Ari Gold, not as rude and crude, but basically like be an agent at a big agency like that. Um, so I didn't have any experience in film or creative arts or scripts or anything like that. So the first thing I did was take on my FMS minor. I took FMS 101 and then I went and found Kevin Sandler who sets up all the summer internship programs 
and he helped me get an in interview with uh, Indian Paintbrush Productions in Los Angeles, which they do uh, a lot of the Wes Anderson movies, if you guys are familiar with them. So when I went to that interview, I was still a business major. I had no experience in writing coverage, which is something they want you to do at most internships, reading scripts, anything like that. So I kind of just used whatever resources I had uh, available to me, which was leaning on my business experience. And I told them I would pretty much do whatever they wanted for the summer, uh, whether it was business, creative, whatever. And they let me come on as a business intern after my sophomore year. So I worked there for a summer doing like box office projections for Moonrise Kingdom, which they were releasing at the time. Uh, and then another movie called Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, which is a Steve Carell and Keira Knightley movie that they were releasing simultaneous. Um, but basically what I spent the summer doing in that first internship in entertainment was just learning as much as I possibly could about the business because I had no real reference point outside of my FMS 101 class of what it meant to work in Hollywood still. So uh, I knew that I wanted to get more onto the creative side, so I basically went to the people who were my higher ups at the company. I told them I wanted to learn to do script coverage. I told them I wanted to learn more about the creative side of film, even though I would get all my business work done as well. And I started the summer interning there two days a week, which is what their requirement was, and the minimum requirement to get my FMS credits. And by the end of the summer, they were asking me to come in like five days a week. I was covering scripts for them as well and doing all my business work. So it was basically just by telling them what I wanted and like having kind of a hustle attitude to get it that I was able to get myself a little bit more exposure than I would have otherwise in that first internship. Um, but what I realized coming out of that and that I really needed to understand much better if I wanted to be successful in getting more internships and in getting a job and being able to kind of speak the language that people speak in entertainment was to have a better basic understanding of story, which I've never really taken writing classes or anything like that. So the first thing I did when I came back was enroll in a screenwriting class with Professor Bradley actually, um, just so I could better understand when I was reading scripts why they made the choices they did, what made a good script, what made good character arcs, you know, what were the imperative pieces in a narrative, uh, et cetera. So I spent that year taking screenwriting and a couple of the required FMS courses, and then I also applied for the Sundance internship that uh, Sandler was just talking about, and I got on that trip, and I got to go to Sundance with um, the whole program. I guess that was three years ago and um, then I started applying for internships again in the spring, and I had another two internships that I lined up after my junior year, uh, which were at two other production companies called Mandalay Films and Level One Entertainment. They're both a little bit smaller, but I guess the biggest takeaway from that as well is that the only reason I got into Level One is because um, Kevin had a connection with someone, one of the executives over there who was at ASU, and then the Mandalay one, I just got on my own. But uh, and I don't even think I've talked about this really with Sandler or Bradley. To be perfectly honest, with both of those internships, I was a little bit disappointed when I got them because I've been applying everywhere. I've been applying like to probably 30 production companies, studios, agencies. I applied at WME, CAA, ICM, UTA. Those are the big four agencies. I applied at all the big six studios. Um, I applied to like the biggest production companies that I could think of and that made the movies I liked. And I think I might have maybe got one email back or one interview. Uh, and then I found Mandalay on level one and took those two internships. And honestly, I think it was probably like the best thing that could have happened because both of them were really small companies where I got a lot of personal attention as an intern. And all I did for both of them all summer was pretty much read scripts and write coverage, which I probably would have been getting coffee and making coffees and doing a lot of other typical intern type duties that are a lot less hands-on at a bigger place. Um, so I just made the most of them and like got the best experience I could. And then came back and actually had one more internship before I graduated with Resolution, which is a now defunct talent agency doing script coverage for them. Um, and that was my first semester of senior year. But I guess without going too much more into it, like the, uh, the thesis of all that is that I tried every single way that I could to set myself up so that when I went to LA after graduation, they could see that I was serious about film, that I'd already had jobs where I was kind of doing the skills that they 
knew I needed to have coming into the job. Um, I got a little bit of chance to answer phones and be a front desk receptionist during those internships. Those are things that matter when you're getting your first job in entertainment. And I had four or five relevant job items from LA actually uh, when I moved out there to say like I've been doing this for the last two years. So um, that's how I kind of started out with um, being in school and using the skills I had from the screenwriting classes to practice you know, writing coverage and talking about film in a meaningful way, talking about scripts with um, you know, creative directors and executives at the companies and making my feedback valuable. And then uh, I guess one other class I should mention before I talk about moving out was a class I took with Sandler as well, which was, um, I think it was 302, something like general media studies, but it was basically about how the industry kind of fits together. And it was about what you know the agencies do specific to the studios and how productions get put together. And it was really the, the business side of film, which is one of the most complicated things about working in entertainment is that it's incredibly convoluted how each company fits together and what they all do. So that class also gave me a really good base level understanding of kind of who each of the players were, uh, what their main role was, and then it gave me a little bit more direction and understanding what um, I wanted to do. And at the time, I thought that would be a talent agent. So uh, a really popular first job for a lot of people who move out to LA is to try and get a job at the talent agencies um, because they are like a central hub of everything that's happening. They have talent departments which rep you know, represent all the actors uh, and they are the ones who are getting offers made to them from studios or other producers. They have lit departments where they rep writers and they rep all the directors um, on these projects. And they also have book departments where they're taking IP and you know, transitioning it to their lit department so someone can write a script about it. And some of them even have sports divisions where they'll get a celebrity EP attached to a project. So the point is they're really at the center of everything that's happening is the talent agencies. So that's what I thought I wanted to do when I moved out is try and get into a mailroom, which is like the most, I shouldn't say popular, but the most um, common first job working at one of the big talent agencies. And then you, you know, become a floater, and then you try and get an assistant desk, and then you go from there. Um, so none of that happened. <laughs> I moved out, um, I guess, four days after I graduated uh, from ASU. I just picked up everything, and I went to LA, and I didn't have a job lined up at all, um, which, again, it's really uncommon, at least in my experience and talking to the people that I know now, to have a job lined up moving to LA uh, in entertainment. It's really hard because they don't like to hire you unless you live in LA. So that's just another good tip to keep in mind even when you're applying for internships, is just to put an LA address on your resume, because uh, otherwise they will just tear it up and not look at it. So uh, I moved to LA in mid-May of, I guess, 2014, and I kind of did what I had been doing with internships. I like sat down and updated my resume, updated my cover letter, sent it to all the big agencies, still sent it around to all the big studios. I had a couple interviews in the first few weeks, but ultimately what got me my first job was my first weekend out in LA. I had a friend of a friend who worked at APA, which is a talent agency, and he took me out drinking at the bars. And he also went out with a bunch of his other assistant friends from APA. And one of them and I got in a deep discussion about what I was looking to do, how I wanted to succeed in the industry, like how badly I wanted it. And he basically was like, I like you, I'm gonna help you get a job. And I think two days later, he sent me a listing for the first assistant job that I, I got in the industry. And it winds up being the same company that I'm at today. But uh, he sent me a listing that said, producer of Jiro Dreams of Sushi seeks assistant, one year agency experience required. Um, so I love that movie, which is like a popular documentary that came out a couple years ago. Um, it was like a big hit once it went to Netflix as well. It made almost $3 million at the box office. I was like, this is cool. I don't really know much about documentaries. This is one of the only ones I know. I don't have a year of agency experience, but I'm gonna apply and just take a shot. And I got called in, and I did six interviews in three days, because it's a really serious company, I guess. I don't know why. And uh, I got the job. So I started out as an assistant direct to the CEO of the company, uh, who, like I said, he was a producer of documentaries and features, but he came from the agency world. He'd been an agent at CAA for 10 years, which is the biggest one. And uh, so that's kind of how he ran and still runs the company. Um, so 
that's a good and a bad thing. There's like a really big stigma around agents and how they act and how they treat people and how agencies are run and what it's like to work there. I got kind of that whole crash course in being his assistant, but I didn't have to go through the full agency system. I kind of just got it in a much more direct one-on-one -on -one experience working for my boss. Um, yeah, it's hard to figure out the best way to talk about being an assistant in Hollywood, but since you guys are all just trying to figure out how to get into the industry, what it's like, what you want to do, what you need to focus on, I think the best thing I can say about it is it's really hard to get a first job where you're going to be happy and feel fulfilled in all the things that you want to do. Like entertainment is, I, I feel like, one of the last true kind of apprenticeship industries where pretty much everybody coming into the industry is going to be an assistant in one way, shape, or form. Whether you're a PA on set, whether you're an assistant at an agency trying to become an agent or a coordinator, whether you're an assistant to a producer and you're learning to produce, or you're a writer PA or a writer's assistant to a writer room, like you basically shadow someone, you answer their phones, you schedule for them, and you figure out how to do their job so that at some point you can become them, replace them, or jump to a different company and use those skills. So my boss having come from an agency and being an agent at CAA for 10 years, especially in the late 90s and early 2000s when it was even a little bit worse, was, for lack of a better phrase, incredibly intense. Um, and it turned out to be like one of the hardest and in certain ways worst year of my life, but it was also the fastest and best growth I've ever had. And it's not just in like learning what you have to do to make it in the industry, all these useful skills of how movies come together, how to get financing for a movie, how to you know speak to a director, how to evaluate a script, how to evaluate a film, but it was also to be honest, it was a big growing up experience um, in that it's really easy to, and, and I think this is true of any industry, but especially in Hollywood, to kind of go out there and like have a you know big head on your shoulders and think like you're ready to crush it and you know you know enough to like do a really good job and have an ego and really quickly that kind of gets kicked out of you. And so it was a really good experience for me to just learn how to work within a system, how to work within a team, how to take direction, how to accept what you don't know, which when you're starting is pretty much everything, and, um, and, and be open to all those new experiences and sometimes scary things that you know, can be a difficult experience. So uh, I was an assistant for a year for him at the company. Um, from the time I left being his assistant to him getting another assistant, he went through something like four or five who all started and quit within a couple weeks because it was too tough. Um, but we finally got another assistant in and I became a coordinator. The company was growing at the time. I was really fortunate that he had, unlike a lot of people in Hollywood, he had an opinion of wanting to promote and, you know, um, I guess vet talent from within. And so, me having been on this desk for a year, I had an opportunity to become a coordinator. And then again, just because the company was growing really quickly, I had the opportunity to become an executive a short time later. So, I've been doing what I'm doing as a manager of worldwide sales and digital affairs for the past year and a half or so. Um, I guess since last July. And so, uh, what that means and what the company does is really complicated. I was talking to one of your professors right before this, uh, this talk and we were speaking about how, I guess some of you guys are in a new media class, is that right? New media and digital and all those other things. So we were talking about how all those areas kind of cross over in entertainment and it's really hard to separate them out and saying, I just work in independent film or I just work in you know, digital movies and shorts. Um, it, it all kind of blends together. So the brief overview of the company and try not to go into too many, of, too many of the gory details. Um, preferred content is mainly two things. We're mainly sales agents, and we're mainly uh, executive producers, financiers, and packagers, packagers of independent film. So on the sales side, what that means as domestic sales agents is we'll come on board movies once they're already completed. Um, independent films, usually sub two or three million dollar budgets both documentaries and narratives, excuse me, and 
will um, basically help them get into a film festival, find a launching point into the market, and then because of our relationships and expertise in the area, help them find distribution. So that's the best deal for a distribution company to take them out, whether it's theatrically, digitally, straight to video, which is a lot less common nowadays. Um, and that's you know all the way up from companies like Sony, we sold, I think, three movies in the last two years to Sony, uh, Paramount, Fox Searchlight, all the studios, to the next tier of kind of like more of the mini majors, whether it's like Lionsgate, or the high-end uh, independent film companies like Weinstein Company, Magnolia, IFC, et cetera. So uh, we'll sell anywhere between 40 and 60 movies a year. That's out of Sundance, South by Southwest, Tribeca Film Festival, uh, Toronto, and an another a other smattering of smaller festivals. Um, and that's like a pure brokerage business. So we're not creatively involved with those films. We take a 10 or 15% fee off of um, the sale that we make. So for example, if we sell a movie to Sony for $500,000, then we take a 50% commission, and then that's our fee on that movie. Um, the other side of the business, which uh, I think is more what gets discussed in school and what more people kind of want to become on the producing side, is the financing and packaging piece, which means that we, um, you know, find a script and a director and a package that we like, like those two pieces, and then we come in to help put the rest together. So if the budget's a million dollars, then we'll figure out how to assemble that financing, whether it's through high net worth uh, individuals and getting people just to invest, whether it makes sense to do foreign pre-sales, which is going around and saying, you know, here's a couple actors in this movie, here's the director and the script, uh, we'll let you distribute it in Australia if you give us a million dollars up front. Um, so that's pre-sales and sometimes debt financing as well. So we'll put together all the money and then more of the fun part that we get to do also is working with the director and uh, doing script notes and kind of bringing it to a place where it's fully ready and then also casting the project. So deciding what actors are going to be valuable for it, deciding who we like for the roles and then making that creative decision with the producers, the director, the rest of the team. Um, how to put together a package that's going to make the best movie and then ultimately that we'll be able to sell. So I just wrote down quickly before we started two, um, two movies that are good examples of each the sales side and the executive producing and financing side that I can just kind of walk you through to better explain the process really quickly. So on the domestic sales side, um, a successful example of a movie that we sold in the last year uh, was a movie called, it was previously called Honey Buddies, it got retitled to be Buddy Moon. Uh, it was a small independent film that was made for something like a hundred thousand uh, dollars. It had basically two main cast members and that was it. One of them was David Giantoli, who's the star of the show Grimm on NBC, and the other was Flu Laborg, who's a popular YouTube comedian. He has like almost a million subs, he was in Pitch Perfect 2. Both kind of middle to lower level talent, people that maybe you would recognize if you saw them, but they're not A-list movie stars by any means. Um, so that movie played at the Slam Dance Film Festival, which is a sister festival to Sundance in Park City at the same time in January. Uh, we heard about the movie when the announcement for Slam Dance came out that uh, of all the titles that were playing the festival. We found out who was involved. We thought the log line sounded funny. We thought the trailer that they had looked really good and through our contacts we reached out, we contacted them, got a cut of the movie in for us to watch and evaluate, decided that it was hilarious, which it is, you guys should all go see it, it's really, really funny. Um, and we ultimately had a meeting with them, signed the movie, and went to Slamdance and premiered it with them. So we brought on a PR team for the festival to help get a bunch of reviews and good press and for them to do interviews with the talent. Um, and we pre-screened it for a couple of the bigger buyers to find out who's going to be the right fit. Um, and, and we didn't get any bites off of the people that we showed it to before the festival. So we then let it screen at Slamdance in January. We exposed it wide to all the distributors who could potentially want to buy it. And after a lot of back and forth in the whole process, we wound up getting a sale to MGM. And the movie got a limited theatrical release and it got put up day date on all the digital platforms 
and the money that they got up front from MGM and their partner wound up getting them out of their budget um, on the initial sale. So even without overages, whatever they made from the theatrical, the digital release, they covered their budget just on the initial sale. So it's kind of a complicated process, but that's a, a basic example of you know, the sales process and working with PR, working with clients, taking a movie to a film festival. Um, and then quickly an example on the financing side and how it kind of feeds the sales business. It's a movie called Ghost Team, which we did earlier this year. We were executive producers on it. We were attached at the script stage. Um, we assembled the financing, which was close to a million dollars on the movie. I think it was like seven or eight hundred thousand um, dollars, somewhere in there. And we helped cast it. The movie was John Heater uh, from Napoleon Dynamite, David Crumholtz, Justin Long, and then a couple lower level comedians. I think Paul Downs was in it as well. Um, so we got the cast together, they started shooting the movie, and we realized because of the level of the cast, because of the concept of the movie, there was an opportunity to pre-sell the movie. So before that movie was actually even done, we shopped it around to the studios, to Netflix and Amazon and all the other people who could have bought it outright before the movie was even finished. We wound up selling it to a company called The Orchard. Again, the sale up front got the, the movie out of all its money. They wound up doing a deal with um, Google and Google Play released it for free online through their Google Play service for something like three weeks. Um, and the premium that they paid to have that right, Google paid to the Orchard, was more than they originally bought it for. And then they put a Netflix deal as well behind it. So I think the movie should be on Netflix in the next couple weeks. And um, they wound up making like a good amount of, of money on that movie. So it's just an example of how we work of putting together financing, finding casts that are meaningful, and then ultimately selling a movie um, in the end of the process. Those are the two main things that we do. Um, we do a couple others in putting together docu-series, elevated docu-series, like in the vein of The Jinx or Chef's Table, um, and working with documentary filmmakers that we've worked with in the past, and you know, helping find homes like broadcast homes or Netflix, HBO, Showtime, etc., cetera, uh, for those docu-series. Um, and then we also have consulting clients as well. But those are the main kind of pieces of what we actually do. Um, so getting away from a little bit more of the business side and, and what I kind of focus on in the day-to-day -day of selling movies and putting together projects, um, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about was how, um, I guess, how to be successful when you first move out and the strategies that you can use like as a, you can start using them as an intern as you guys are getting internships in Los Angeles as well, but also just kind of what it takes to actually be successful once you're out there, once you get the first job and not have it be the case where you go out to LA and you're there for a couple months and you either can't find a job or you you know find a job that isn't exciting or fulfilling to you and you wind up coming back and not kind of realizing that dream or hope or expectation. Um, I, I, I wrote down a couple of things that I thought were key and I, I was discussing earlier today with Sandler and Bradley, but I guess the first one is realizing that the industry and, and entertainment in general more so than I think probably any other traditional job or industry is incredibly social and pretty much, well not all, but a good percentage of the jobs that people get, whether it's their first job or their second or third job, whenever, is because of the relationships and networking that they've done previously. So it's the reason that internships and ASU helping me get those internships were so important in the first place. Um, it's kind of, again, a little bit convoluted, but the way that I knew the friend I was going out with who introduced me to the person who got me my first job was because of an internship I had. I interned with him at level one after my junior mm. year. Um, and my roommate right now, who works at APA, is searching for a job. And I think he had like two interviews last week solely off me picking up the phone and calling a friend and saying, hey, I know you have this opening. Um, I have a really great guy that you should bring in and see. So starting off, and especially for you guys still being in school, it's why internships are so critical besides 
getting an understanding of the industry and knowing what it's like to actually work out there, starting to understand how the pieces fit together, is the people that you're gonna meet and the impression that you're gonna make on them. Um, I think from, yeah, that's right, from all three internships that I did in LA from um, Indian Paintbrush, Level One, and Mandalay, I had all three of those people making calls for me when I moved out and it's what helped me get the one or two interviews that I did. So the point is that even now at this early stage, like the relationships that you make with people who are out there working in the industry are incredibly important. One of the first people that I called when I decided I want to work in film was I think a, a first cousin of my brother's girlfriend because he was the only person I knew in Hollywood and he helped tell me like where to go as well. So. As much as you can find the companies you want to work out at, send out your resume, have a strong resume, have a strong cover letter, be good in a room and everything else, it's really, really important to take all your networking opportunities really seriously because all those people can help you down the line and you never know who knows you know, the, that person that you're going to interview with um, like next week. So when I was um, an assistant, I guess for my first year out there, and, and this is still true now, I would get drinks with other assistants, something like three to four nights a week. Um, I got drinks with the assistants from the agencies and from production companies and some from studios. I work in independent films, so less studios, but ultimately when my boss would ask me for something that he would need or he'd say like, I need to figure out how to get into this party at X, Y, or Z festival, I knew exactly who to call at CAA and be like, hey, I need a favor or who I could get to help me out in those situations. So the first thing about being successful is like taking all those networking and social opportunities really seriously, making all the relationships with people you can, and then also it just gives you a better opportunity to understand what other people's jobs are because it is easy to come into the industry and wind up working just at a production company and not understanding you know, what it is to be in PR, what it is to be at a talent agency. And so the, all those networking opportunities really give you a chance to understand what other people's jobs are like. Um, the second thing that uh, we talk about a lot, and it, it's kind of a funny phrase, but everybody in Hollywood uses it and talks about it all the time, is how hungry you are. Um, and it's probably the biggest reason, honestly, that people move out to LA and then ultimately wind up coming back and not staying there, I think, is that and this isn't meant to scare you, and it's not a bad thing if you don't feel the same way or once you like really you know, have an internship and experience it, or once you talk to people in the industry and decide it's not for you, but it's a really, really hard industry. It's really stressful, and there's a lot of people competing for the same type of jobs, and whatever vein of the industry, whatever part of it you want to go into, whether it is post-production, working in publicity, marketing, you know, producing movies, being an agent, whatever it is, um, it's the same kind of experience. It's long hours, it's really stressful, and it's intense. And there's a lot of people who are fighting for the exact same position that you are. So, and it sounds so obvious and silly to say, but you have to really, really want it. And you have to be willing to put up with certain things and have a thick skin. Um, I met really briefly with a small group of students yesterday and we were just talking about what the experience is actually like being a first year assistant, what it's actually like being on someone's desk. And that can vary from one end of the spectrum of your boss being really nice to the other end of, you know, I'm sure you guys hear the horror stories of Harvey Weinstein throwing staplers at his assistants and, you know, like Scott Rudin pulling over the side of the road and like kicking his assistant out of the car and making him walk home. Like, there are the people that are really, really terrible in the business. I think there are a lot fewer and farther between, but the point is, in general, regardless whether your boss is really nice or not, your first year out there, your first couple years even, are a struggle. It is in some way a rite of passage. You're trying to learn a completely new world, and there's high expectations, and you're going to be working your butt off the entire time. So it's not you know, like you jump into it and you start writing screenplays the day you get out there. It's tough for a while, and sometimes even for a long time. And so the idea of really being hungry and really wanting it and hustling and being willing to go get drinks four nights a week when you're exhausted after working a 12 hour day, like those are the type of people that make it. It's not always necessarily the smartest person or the nicest person, even though 
both of those things are really important qualities and can ingratiate you with people. It's ultimately the people who are like willing to put their nose to the grindstone and work the long hours, network with people in the right way, and um, they're ultimately usually the ones who, who stand out and are also the ones who get ahead. Um, so I guess one other thing I wanted to talk about or just go a little bit more into detail about was um, I talked a bit about at, at my first job how it was kind of a growing up experience um, and a lot of that was because I had a tough boss but a lot of it was also just because I was like thrown into a situation that I'd never been in before and I was forced to and maybe this seems like a little bit more personal than, than what you think you need to know to, to make it in film, but I, I was like forced to face a lot of things about myself that I'd never really been forced to face, like things that I was bad at and didn't want to accept that I was bad at, that I like had an ego and I had to figure out how to like check that at the door and take instruction from my boss and realize when I was being a bad assistant and all those things. Um, another was just in general confidence. Like I always thought I was an incredibly confident person and my first year at the job totally redefined what that even meant to me. Um, I guess the best example or, or way it was always phrased to me is a confident person is always gonna be confident. And that even means in a situation where they don't know the information. Like being able to admit that you don't know something confidently is still being confident, even if you're wrong in a situation or you don't know how to answer a question, like being able to step up and admit that in the moment was a huge learning experience for me as well. And that goes hand in hand with also like being vulnerable and admitting when you make mistakes. And um, you know, there's other, there's other facets to it. But the point is like the first year was not just like a kind of academic type grad school for me, but it was this moment of realizing that you're in a completely new place, learning all these things that you've never known before, and you have to like be open to um, not just changing your routines and, and changing and kind of redefining like all the things that you want and how to accomplish them, but also being able to be like introspective and realize how to adjust and be malleable and become that person so you can get the things done that you want to get done. Um, I think that those are the main points that I wanted to cover specific to my job and what I do. But I know Sam, there was some stuff that you wanted to talk through as well. Uh, that, I, I, there's a one question that certainly uh, I'll ask some, uh, some more uh, after we open it up to everybody as well as the other professors that are here. But uh, what, uh, what happens if you don't have the time or maybe the money to perhaps do an internship in the summer, but in Los Angeles, what are the opportunities or what do you recommend that people do in order to kind of best prepare themselves uh, wherever they're located, presumably in, in, in Phoenix, at least during the fall and spring, uh, so when they do want to make that leap, that uh, they're able to do so with the most efficient uh, way possible? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, there's a couple different things. I mean, the resolution internship, for example, which was the, it was a smaller agency that I was doing coverage for remotely the first semester of my senior year. Um, I was in Arizona the whole semester working for them. The way I got that job was, again, like a networking thing. I just heard it through a friend who was working in Hollywood that he had just gotten an internship with them and that I should apply for it. Um, and I got that internship remotely, but, and this is again about just being hungry and like setting yourself apart, I drove out on the same day to the orientation and I did the orientation in LA so they could see my face, know who I am, and like who they're gonna be working with all semester, and then I drove back the same day. So I couldn't be in LA for the semester, but I made the commitment and showing them that I was gonna drive out seven hours and then seven hours back, because LA traffic is horrible. Um, that like I'm willing to do that and I'm, I'm like gonna work hard. I, it matters to me and I'm serious about it. And that like really helped set me apart to them because they knew that I did that. So there's potential for some remote internships. Um, 
though they may be few and far between. Uh, the other thing is, there are local companies that, that do internships, like marketing type internships with the theaters I know. I mean, if you can't go to LA, then having an internship that's somehow related to entertainment is always gonna be better than not. So even if it's in Arizona, it's still, you know, at least tangential to what they're gonna be talking about or what they do. Um, and it's a talking point for you, right? It's a talking point that you wanna work in movies and it's another line on your resume. Um, and then the last thing I guess is just, and, and this is regardless of internships, but it's really paying attention to the skills and knowledge that you're gaining in your classes and being able to actually talk about that in a meaningful way in, uh, in your interviews and when you're starting to apply for jobs. So if you can't be out in LA for a semester or a year, but you know you need to work on being better at reading scripts and writing coverage, then you should make sure you take a screenwriting class. And you should make sure that you're talking with your professor about how to speak meaningfully about screenplays and what the expectation is in the industry. Um, so there's always ways you can just be better in yourself and you know, like having more knowledge that's gonna be helpful to you when you get to that point to be ready to move out to Los Angeles. Should I open it up for questions? Well, actually, Adam, I wanted to. Yeah. I wanted to, uh, not to embarrass you, certainly, uh, you, could, you could talk about other people's mistakes too, but you said um, be willing to admit your mistakes. Is yeah. There any, are there any pitfalls or mistakes you feel you've made or mistakes you saw other people make? You'd like to warn them not to. I made about 100 mistakes a day, and I got yelled at for every single one of them. So, um, no, I, I, it wasn't as much of like a macro. As much of a macro comment on making mistakes, right? I mean, maybe it was like approaching the work wrong or having a bad attitude about something that I shouldn't. You know, like at the beginning of my job, I, it never even crossed my mind to come back to Arizona or to give up on what I was doing. That being said, if I'm being honest and transparent for the first couple months of my job, and my, my now boss knows this and fully embraces it, um, I was absolutely miserable and I hated my boss. I thought he was a terrible person. And I went in every day to work just feeling bad about it. And it wasn't until I was willing to like readjust my outlook on the whole situation and that, to be perfectly honest, I was really lucky to have a job out of college where I was an assistant to a producer and an assistant to the CEO of a company, not having to be in a mail room and having access to the amount of you know, privileged conversations and information that I had and that I should make the best of it, that I was able to like meaningfully move myself forward, get better at my job and, and just be more open to the information that was being shared with me and actually learning versus just having a bad attitude, doing the work and going home and you know grinding my teeth and cursing to myself about how horrible my life is. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the best example of, of being willing to like admit your mistakes or just be introspective and try and be malleable in, in how you you know interact with these situations. Would you, uh, are, are there any big mistakes you saw someone else make them? Or no? Mm. You ever see someone get fired? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I did, uh, mostly because they weren't doing all the things I was just talking about, right? Like they didn't interact with the work right, they didn't have a good attitude. They also weren't that intelligent, but if they had been better at a lot of other aspects of what they were doing, it wouldn't have been as big of a deal. Um, so it's more like a cumulative thing than a, yeah. than a single event. Yeah. Um, wait, so what was the original question about making mistakes? Have I seen other people make big mistakes? Is that what you were saying? Well, if you, if you had any advice for them about don't do this awful thing that I saw someone do and it cost them big or... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's different wherever you work, right? Like I've heard stories, actually, I, this guy went to ASU, but he was not an FMS major, he was another major, which I won't say. Um, but he worked at CAA for a really big talent agent, and I think he was there three days, um, and he got fired off her desk uh, because he, he thought that she was not treating him fairly in certain of the things that she was saying, and he went behind her back to HR and he said, I want to move desks. And she found out and she was like, you should have come to me first. And the fact that you weren't honest with me about how you were feeling, like I don't want to have an assistant like that. And he was fired from the whole company. He didn't go to another desk, he got fired. Yeah. Uh, 
So, but that's specific, you know, to, to CAA or whoever else, like, you just have to read your surroundings and the, the politics of the place that you're at, whether it's corporate or not, and then understand how to play within that system. Um, so there's no like one big mistake that I guess I can point to, you know, with people. Yeah, but I'll open it up to questions, I guess. Yeah. Um, my question for you, you mentioned that um, the job you had now, that you have now, uh, the um, desired qualification was a year of agency experience. Did the fact that you had had the three internships over a period of time, did that help kind of supplant that desired qualification? No. You want to talk about embarrassing me and putting me on the spot? I'll tell you what did actually. They told me this afterwards, um, and this sounds so crappy to say. The, the point of the story, before I even tell you, is that you should find ways to put things on your resume. If there's anything that really sets you apart, or you think potentially makes you special, it's worth listing, whether it's in other skills or otherwise. But I put in my other that I was a member of Mensa, and they wanted to bring me in and see what that looked like. And I'm sure they were sorely disappointed. But, um, but you know, that was what the one thing was that caught their eye off my resume. It was like, that's unique and random, and he doesn't have a year of agency experience, but I just want to meet this kid. And that's probably why it took six interviews as well. I met with his assistant then, I met with both of the lower level executives, I met with him that night at like 10 o'clock at a bar, or, or a restaurant bar, and then I came in the next two days and met his business partner, um, and then I met with him again, and then he offered me the job. So. Yeah, it was not a fun process, but it, yeah, I mean, there's just like little things that you can do to set yourself apart. That was pure luck that, you know, I Isn't had. true? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. So when you switched over to film from economics yeah. and marketing, did you know what you wanted to do or were you just taking a leap of faith? I had no idea. Um, I was just really bored in economics classes. Uh, and, and I thought marketing was going to be like more creative in the way I wanted, and it wasn't. And I'd always really loved film, so I just decided to give it a shot. Um, I, you know, like I was explaining, I work now in domestic film sales. I didn't know what domestic film sales was when I went into the interview for my job. Like, they were like, oh, well, we produce movies and we work in domestic film sales. And I just smiled and nodded. I'm like, uh-huh, that's cool. And um, now I sell my own movies, right? And like, I, it's two and a half years later, and I started selling my own movies a year and a half later. So I had no idea. I just knew I wanted to work in film in some way, and I wanted to figure out a way, and this is what I didn't understand before and, and why I think I didn't get into film earlier. I wanted to find a way to work in film that was like I could use my transferable skills. Like I thought, I'm, I'm a driven and relatively intelligent guy, but I have no idea how, you know, how creative I am. I don't know if I can write a movie, I don't know if I can direct a movie, like, but I want to work in film and find a way to fit in that industry. And then I kind of, the whole world opened up of like, this is an industry just like any other. Whether you go work in the financial industry or marketing or you know engineering or whatever it is, there's like businesses and they hire good people who are driven and a lot of times it has nothing to do with creativity or otherwise. And I, I just didn't understand the landscape of the business at all. So I was really fortunate to kind of fall into what I did now, um, even because the, all the previous internships that I've had didn't make me privy to that information. I had no idea like about the independent film world or playing film festivals. You know, I'd been to Sundance, but that was pretty much the extent of it. Other questions? Yeah. So do you use do you see filmmakers pitch ideas to you, um, either? before they we got in production or maybe then after they have some of their own production pre-started? For the film sales stuff, no. We're just getting finished films. For the producing, the executive producing, yes. Um, but it's it's rare because we're not development executives. You know, we're not coming on and paying a writer fifty thousand dollars to write a script off of a treatment. We usually there's already a script in place and there's a director attached. Not always, but usually. Um, but we will read a script that we like, watch a director's short or their previous feature film. Like I did this last, I guess on Friday, I, like I read a script or a treatment from a director I really liked. 
Um, we sat down and met with her, gave her all our notes on the treatment, how the script should come out, but we're not going to get attached until there's a script. So I hear pitches, yeah, more reading treatments and reading scripts. Um, so usually it's not that early stage, but yeah. From your experience, those who want to get in on the creative production side of things, is um, the path similar to what you went through? Specifically what? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Um, if you want to get in on the creative side, like actually producing the film, is a path similar to what he went through, and like. Uh, Usually, being a creative producer. No, but keep working on set, as in like uh, yeah. being an AD or a PA or anything like that. It totally depends. So, I mean, most on-set producers, like you're talking about, most creative producers and, and ones that are doing development and working with filmmakers, um, and they're like on set every day, shepherding the process. It really just depends. There's no right way. A lot of them worked at agencies and decided they didn't like that world, then they went to a production company and had a little bit more experience on set and creatively, and then decided they were just going to make the jump and go do creative producing. Some of them were executives and had a little experience doing it at a small production company and then went and did it on their own. Um, some people just go PA, like you're saying, and try and move their way up on the set. I don't really have experience with that. I mean, I have a lot of friends who do, who PA'd and then tried to move up in that world. I mean, especially if you want to be an AD, like if you want to be something really specifically creative like that, like a filmmaker, an auteur, then yeah, you need to be working on set. Um, understanding the business of it is never going to hurt you. It always is going to help you. Understanding how movies get put together and financed, what the landscape looks like of, of selling movies, what's commercial and what's working and why is always going to be to your benefit, whether you're a director or whatever. But yeah, I mean, the sooner you can get on set, the better. And we would always talk about this in Bradley's script writing class, and the same thing happens in Hollywood all the time. Because in LA, everybody's a writer. Everybody wants to be a director or an actor or something like that. They have some creative you know, ambition that they're still harboring, myself included. So um, the point is that if you want to be a writer, then you should be writing every day. If you want to be a stand-up comedian, you should be doing stand-up six days a week. If you want to be a director, it doesn't matter if you have a day job from you know, whatever, 8.30 to 7, you then you take the weekends and you go shoot something with your friends and try and get into a film festival. So there's an, a myriad of ways to do it, but you just have to pick what you want to do and, and then find a way to chase it, even if, you know, what you're doing in the day-to-day -day isn't specifically moving you in that direction. But in all likelihood, what you're doing during the day in some other way is going to be beneficial. Like, I probably don't want to sell movies for the rest of my life. You know, film sales is not my passion. I enjoy it, and it's given me an incredibly good understanding of the landscape of films. I have great contacts at the studios because of it, and you know, at distribution companies, and it's given me all these other skills that I can put towards, you know, understanding how to write a better movie. But I still have to go home and write all the time. Otherwise, like, you're not moving yourself forward. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, could you say a little louder? Um, coverage is really important because it teaches you how to talk about scripts in a meaningful way. And it teaches you how to be concise when you need to be. And it teaches you to have it teaches you to have an opinion on all the different pieces of a script or a story, right? Like, you can read a script where the characters are all great and really fully developed, but the dialogue is just total crap. And, and you, like, learn to separate those things out in coverage, right? Because you can break it down kind of point by point. Um, but the only other lesson I guess I learned from it, besides understanding scripts and how to talk about them, not only to executives, but it, I use it now in how I talk to filmmakers about their scripts, is... Um, is again just being malleable and willing to work with people in the way they want to be worked with. Like I, when I worked at Mandalay in level one, level one would want me to write a page and a half coverage, um, like you know, single space page and a half for any script I read, whether it was nine, you know, 80 pages or 120 pages. And then Mandalay would want me to write like a four page single space coverage in much more detail. And so I'd just have to like flip the switch day in and day out for where I was going. So it just teaches you think about things in a different way potentially, and then understanding story and what's good and why and how to break it down in a very uh, compartmentalized way.
Yeah, we'll start and then I'll see what, yeah. No, no problem. Um, my first question is like, with uh, Hollywood, it's kind of stereotypical, but like it's considered really cutthroat. And like, do you think that you've had to give up like any of your morals or anything, or like had to like, kind of like take your job away from someone else in order yeah. for you to get ahead? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> Uh, I wish I had like, a horrible story of something I'd done. No, uh, I, I, I don't feel like I had to compromise any of my morals. Again, I had to be... You have to be willing to redefine certain things and just how you look at them and approach them. But at in, in no point did I feel like I compromised anything about who I am as a person or how I interact with other people. Um, I think it enhanced it and, and slightly highlighted certain things about my personality and maybe muted other things about my personality just because you're working with different types of people and you have to know when to act different ways. Um, but no, you can be a good person and, and still succeed. There are a lot of people that aren't good people and some of them succeed too, but it's not necessarily do that, right? Um, yeah, I don't know how to better answer that question, but but ultimately, no. I, like, I was actually talking to uh, Professor Bradley about this earlier today. Like, I was worried when I moved out there that certain things about myself might change, uh, or I might get caught up in some of that world and how people act, and it became very clear to me from the time I moved out there within just a month or two that the people that want to schmooze with fancy people and that's what matters to them and it's about aesthetics and you know appearance or they're gonna act shitty their assistant at some point in the future, like, that becomes very clear that there was already something there. And that's just becoming magnified. Um, but I realized that I just wasn't that way. And, and I, you know, it, it never like affected me. And then another question I have is, I'm not really that intelligent on like the whole coverage thing. So are you just reading the scripts to like, Write the coverage and like tell them like this is what you think of it and like they're reading it so they're like okay we'll use this script or is it more yeah so agents a lot of agents are lazy <laughs> they would say otherwise but they don't want to like go home and read scripts themselves right because they're working crazy hours and their jobs are really stressful and you know intense and they're not going to go home and read a 90 page script because even if you read really fast that's at least an hour of your time so. Uh, they have, yeah, the interns, sometimes the assistants, but honestly it's usually interns, write like a page and a half summary. They have them say whether it's good, bad, whether they should track the director and pass on the script, whether they should, you know, move forward and have someone else more senior read the script. They're just giving quick notes for you to reference. Um, yeah, so sometimes scripts won't even get past interns, right? They won't even get up to the next level and no one, I don't want to say meaningful, but no one who could do anything about it will even read a script because it doesn't get past um, the interns covering it. And then I think the last question I have that I remember is um, with your internships and everything that you had, like being able to like, and the jobs that you had, being able to pay for student loans and everything, like the financial aspect, like is this a good line of work for that? Or do you ever have to get like a part-time job for a restaurant? Is it a good line of work to make money? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the answer to that. I mean, you start out and you make nothing in Hollywood. It's again because it's so competitive, especially at the agencies. I mean, the jobs that you're fighting for, they're getting thousands and thousands of resumes. I mean, actually, a lot of the way that people get hired at agencies, this is just a good tip to know, is they'll send in the resume and they'll get a call six months later. That happens all the time. It doesn't mean you didn't get a job if you don't hear back. Like, they won't call you, they won't say anything for six months, and then they'll call you and say, you were the next up on our, you know, on our stack that we're pulling off of. We liked your resume. Um, so it's just so highly competitive that they don't have to pay people, and they don't. So it takes a while, and it, you know, it's hard. So no, uh, it's not easy, but you can get creative and figure it out. Can I, can I just jump in also? As far as coverage goes, you can go online and just find coverage samples. What is coverage? And, you know, like every company is probably going to want a little bit different. If you were, if you were running as an intern, though, they'll give you, they'll give you an example of how they like it done. And, and, but you should have, I don't know, I, I don't know if you feel this is necessary, but it seems like a good idea if you have some 
coverage to show how you, you know, so if you looked online and found some samples of it and, and sort of followed those. I mean, you should, you should know how to do coverage really well and you should cover scripts as practice for sure. But that being said, I don't know of a company that's ever asked me for an existing coverage sample. It was always they give you a script and ask you to cover it. Because they have the coverage that it's, you know, they're going to compare you against. So they'll give you a sample, say here's what we like. Like you're saying, it's different for every company, whether it's one and a half pages, four pages. You know, they want you to be very long-winded or very concise. Um, and then they'll give you a script. Again, my roommate who's applying for jobs right now just um, applied for a job at a big distribution company and they sent him a script to cover, which he probably won't even have to do at the job, but they want to know how he thinks about movies and how he interacts with scripts. So yeah, it's a really important skill to have. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what are some of the, uh, the prop kinds of properties, themes, genres that either your company or the independent film world is kind of looking at? And are certain ones of those that are better uh, for film, television, digital media? Mm. That's a really broad question, but uh, independent film right now is just really hard, I guess, to preface it. People aren't paying what they used to pay for it. You know, the world of going to Sundance and selling a movie overnight to the Weinstein company that has limited cast for like $2 million, it just doesn't happen anymore. Pretty much all independent narrative movies that are selling for a number up front, for an advance, uh, or an MG, minimum guarantee, has some level of recognizable cast. Usually, there's at least one A or B list actor in it. So that's a baseline for even if you're genre agnostic. Um, horror film doesn't work very well anymore. It's just kind of a dying genre and independent film. Um, documentaries are huge right now. We used to sell about 50-50 documentaries versus narratives. We probably sell something like 60% documentary now and 40% narratives just because there's a, a much bigger uh, demand for it because all the premium cable companies want it. HBO, Showtime, now Stars buys documentaries as well. Um, you know, Netflix and Amazon and also the broadcasters. Like I sold a documentary in January to Discovery and Lionsgate who partnered on it. So that's huge business right now, independent <coughs> film. Um, and then straight drama is hard as a rule. That's as, as, as well as I can be concise about it for independent film. Uh, in digital, it's a whole other world, and I actually didn't even touch on it. That's the other half of my job specifically right now. I sell movies half the time, and the other half of what I do is putting together digital packages, which is, you know, trying to find, I guess, influencer is still the phrase that's used, like a digital influencer, um, whether that's a YouTuber or an Instagram star or someone like that who is trying to act but has some sort of social media following and putting together a package with them, whether for a show or for a movie, um, those, that, um, what's the word? That model right now is, is really popular of making like a million to two million dollar movie with Amanda Cerny and Lele Pons and whoever these other YouTube influencers are and like putting it up on either full screen or YouTube Red um, or one of those new digital services. So that's specific to the digital media model. And yeah, I guess that's the best, the best overview I can give for independent and digital for what's working and not. But it's really hard right now. Any more questions? Richard, it has um, your, the digital side and your job reached into virtual reality yet? Um, we look at it, but we haven't engaged yet. Um, a lot of those people are working in virtual reality. And they're doing it in a lot of different ways because there's so many different softwares and hardwares. Like, there's this really popular YouTube channel that we work with uh, called Black Box TV, which is like the biggest horror YouTube channel. And their big new thing is working in these little, I guess they're like VR experience domes. Uh, and they're working in 3D video in that way. Other people are working specific to Oculus. It's, it's up and coming but it's so non-perfected, especially when it's not a game, when it's a media experience, because what everyone talks about in entertainment right now is that the whole point of a movie is you're watching what the director wants you to watch, right? It's like right here, and he can show you the experience that he or she wants you to see. Um, but in VR, it's hard to tell a story that way because it's completely subjective to the viewer. 
So they're still figuring all that out and what that means for longer form type content. Um, so it's upcoming, probably not for another couple of years. As like a meaningful revenue stream, I guess I should say. Yeah. Have many of your friends found success or just a few, maybe not many, from when you graduated? Uh, I think everyone who I know of who came out in my class is actually doing really well. Um, from ASU specifically. But there are plenty of people who I know, who I worked with, who burned out and left, or didn't get the position they wanted within a short timeline, decided they didn't want to stick it out because it wasn't worth it to them. But everyone from my FMS class who I know who went out, one of them is, um, she works in PR, she's doing really well. One of them works at Nickelodeon and is an executive. He's doing amazing in uh, animation. And uh, a couple work as writer PAs on MTV shows. Like they're all scattered all over doing different things. But uh, yeah, I, actually, I think I'm, I'm trying to think if anyone from my class came back or, or wasn't happy with the experience. I don't know, Kevin. Maybe you know better. <laughs> well, they were, your class was very successful. Yeah. So I think of like the eight or so people, six, eight people that I actually knew from FMS that I was close with. All of them are doing well. I mean, a lot of people didn't move out in the first place, but yeah. Anything else? Cool. Well, great. Thank you, guys. Yeah.